Continuing on with exploring data, we are going to talk now about everything logical, operators, vectors, and expressions. So I want to start out by defining the difference between those three words. Operators are these special functions that can go in between two arguments. We've already seen them with things like the plus sign or even the pipe operator. We'll use logical operators often to build up logical expressions. So the full expression um, includes the operator, but then also the pieces that, it, that the parameters that it's incorporating. And then finally, the output from that expression will be a logical vector. So let's look at that a little bit here. I've put kind of a cartoon of this. Say that you have a vector named hair color. This might take different colors like brown and red and so on. And you can see right now that this example is of a length five. There are five elements in that vector. We might want to check and figure out each spot in this vector where the hair color takes a certain color. For example, it's brown. We could set that up as a logical expression. So I put that right here. We're saying here that we want to check where the hair color vector, where the value equals with that double equal sign, brown. So the double equal sign here is the operator, and then this full expression is called the logical expression. The output that we get from this is a vector the same length as our original vector, where for each spot on that original vector, it's giving the check for the condition that we ask for in the logical expression. So for example, the first value in hair color is brown. That does equal brown, and so our first value here is true. The next value in the vector is red, and that does not equal brown, so our next value is false, and so on. You start at using these just a little bit inside of filter functions. So it's really useful to know these logical expressions for a number of reasons, but especially when you're trying to clean up and explore your data. It lets you take a larger data set and pull down to just a subsection of it where that subsection is meeting certain conditions. So I just mentioned that the output of a logical expression is a logical vector. And it's important to know a little bit about that. So the first thing to know about that is it will always be the same length as the initial vector that you're checking. So we can look for an example there with our example data set. Um, if you've been following along for some of the other videos, you might already have this set up. But if not, you could go through any code that you wrote previously for that and run it so that you have the same data frame to work with. So if I run that, we can come down here and take a look at it. You can see at this point, to, for this code to run correctly, you should have a column named sample time that's been converted into that date time class. Then one called value. This is give, giving the PM 2.5 value for each of these observation times. Uh, QC, which is a quality control metric, and then AQI, where we translated these PM 2.5 values into the air quality index category. Once we do that, we can do some different vectors, uh, some different um, logical expressions and logical vectors with this. So for example, we might want to pinpoint every place where the value, the PM 2.5 measurement, is over 500. So we could set up and we'll pull out just that column to start with. So again, you can use the dollar sign with value. And just to give you a reminder, let's do this with head first so you can, you can see what this is going to look like. All right, we, you've used head before maybe when you've been working with a data frame and it gives you the first six rows. You can use it with a vector like this. Remember, a column is, is essentially just a vector when you pull it back out. And in the case of a vector, it'll give you the first six values. So if we run that, you can see that we have the first six values, and these line up exactly with the first six values in the first six rows if we're looking at the whole data frame. So we can add in our logical expression now. We might want to say um, check and see for each of these values if they're higher than 500. So in this case, again, the operator is the greater than, greater than sign. And then this whole thing, the Beijing PM value greater than 500, that's a logical expression. As the output, we get a logical vector. And you can see it's evaluated each of these to see if they're higher than 500. So the first value is 505. That's higher than 500. So our first value in what's returned from running the logical expression is true. The second one was 485, that's lower than 500, so the second is false, and so on. So we can look through and check for the length of this as well. So I'm going to change that head call to a length call, 
And again, that tells us that we have about 4,300 measurements for this Beijing PM value. And then if we want to check the same thing for the logical vector that we get out, we can run length on that. And you can see that that's, a, that's the same length, so they really line up. All right, so I've got a few slides here that are that's covering the things I just showed you in the RStudio session, and you can feel free to use those to take notes. The next thing that's important to note here is that because we have a, a vector that's the same length in, in the logical vector that we get out, we can use mutate to add that on as a new column in our data frame. So we can add on a new column to the Beijing data where we have this logical vector, this true-false, of whether the PM value is over 500. So we'll come back in here, and since I'm going to be changing the data at this point, I'll actually put this up in the script. So first I'll set it up and run it and make sure it looks okay, and then I'll reassign the object that's named Beijing PM to have this value. So we'll pipe in the Beijing PM data frame. And then we want to use mutate because we're adding in a new column that's a function of some of the other columns that we have. So in this case, I'll name it beyond index and then equals, and I'll use this expression. So once we're piping in, we don't have to use the dollar sign to pull out that column. We can just refer to the column names themselves. So the column name we want to check is value. And then we'll do that it's greater than 500. So let's take a look at that and see if I See if I did it right. All right, this is looking good. So now we have this new column right here called beyond index. And in each case, it's gone through and looked at the value column in that row. And if it's over 500, it, it gives a true here. And if it's under 500, it gives a false right here. So that looks good. So I'll now add that on so we, we have that newer version of the Beijing PM object and run that. So again, this is just showing that example if you'd like to take some notes on what we were just covering in the RStudio session. Another thing that we could do here is we could work with that date time value. So in an earlier video for this chapter, I talked about how you can convert something into a date time class. And this is one of the places where that comes in really useful, where it'll be much better to have it in that class than to have it in the original character vector. Um, so what we can do here is we could add in something where we check the time. And this could be interesting in this case because in Beijing, there's a certain season when heating is on in the homes. And, and during that season, the sources for pollution change a little bit. Now, from year to year, it changes exactly when that starts or ends, but um, typically it will end on March 15th of each year. And with this data set, I think we only have about six months worth of data. So this will do a division between the days in our data set, the, the recorded observations that were during the heating season versus those that weren't. So what I'm going to do here, I'll do mutate again to add on some more. So let's pipe in Beijing PM. And then we'll do a mutate. And we're going to again set it up where we create a no new column using those, um, those uh, logical expressions. So I'll name the new column heating. And in this case, I want to test this sample time column. So I'll put that in there. And then let's think through how to do this. So I want to figure out if it's heating, those were days that came before um, March 15th, I believe. Is that right? Yes, March 15th. So this was um, well, what ones that were earlier than 217 and then March and then 15. So I put that in. The only other trick we need to do is because this is in a date time class, some version of a date class, we need to make sure that we're checking it against something in that same class of data. So if you'll remember, we can use YMD from the Luber Day package, and you'll want to make sure that you have that loaded. Um, but we'll use that YMD to convert this into that special class. And we can check this. So if we run just this, it'll print out that date, but we can also take that and pipe it into that class function to double check what class it is. And you can see, oh, you can see them by doing the YMD. It's taken that character vector that I've set up right here and converted it into a date class. So now we can do this comparison. So let's try writing that. And you can see we've got that one added now, and we'll just reassign the whole data set to, to include that column. So now if we check our data set, 
we can see that that's got everything that we need. So a few comments here about using these logical expressions. Um, one is that there is a bang operator that's really useful sometimes in creating these logical expressions, especially if you want to filter just to, to one part of your data. So this will take a full expression and it'll flip it. Everything that was false becomes true and vice versa. We can look at that in this example here. I'm taking a vector of link three with the numbers one, two, and three. And I want to see if it's equal at each position to a vector with one, two, and five. So what R will do is go through and it'll check the first position first. Is one equal to one? Yes, it is. So in the, the vector that it outputs, the first value is true. Next, is two equal to two? Yes. So that second value is true. And then finally, is three equal to five? That's not true. So this last one becomes false. If we take this whole expression and put parentheses around it, and then use a bang operator in front of that, it will take the whole thing and flip it. So where we had true, true, false, now we have false, false, true. It turns out this can be really helpful. Um, a lot of times you'll find that it might be easier to express what you don't want than what you want. And so in this case, you can write out that logical expression to say exactly what you don't want and then put the whole thing in parentheses and put a bang at the beginning, and then it'll give you exactly what you want. One time when this is particularly helpful is when you're looking for missing values and when you're trying to filter out any rows that have missing values for a certain column. So if you'll remember, there's this special operation, logical operation is.na, that will take a vector and check for each position if it is a missing value. So in this example, I'm using it on a vector where we've got one, two, and then a missing value, and that evaluates to false, false, and then true. And if we put a bang operator, uh, in front of it, then now it's going to be true any place where we're not missing the value and false any place where we are missing a value. And so that will easily, if we put it in a filter function, let us filter out places where we've got missing data. Another operator that's really useful is the n operator. So it looks like this, it's the word n, but then it's got percent signs on either side. And it's really important when you use this not to put any spaces there in the middle. So this is another one of those operators that comes in between uh, two vectors in this case. What this lets you do is instead of going through and saying that each value is exactly equal to a certain value, it lets you say, is it one of a number of values in a set? So in this case, on the right-hand side of n, we've got the set of the numbers 1 and 5. So what this will do is check each of the numbers of our first vector and see if it's either one or five, if it's anything in this set. So one is, our set includes one and five. So that evaluates to true, but then two and three don't belong in there. They're not members of the set of one and five. So those both evaluate to false. It turns out this can be really useful. You could set this up as well as a series of different logical expressions joined by or. For example, if we want to look and see if the vector is exactly equal to one or if the vector is exactly equal to five. But if you do like that, and if you have a number of things that you're trying to, to check against, <laughs> it becomes a really, really long expression. So this becomes a really succinct way to check and see if it's a member of a, of a collection of items. Now that you have the idea of how to create this logical vector, there are a number of interesting things you can do with it. Um, and I'm gonna show some examples here where we've added it as a column in our data frame and then done things with it. So one example is that you can use it directly for filtering. We have put logical expressions in when we filter, but where these logical vectors are already giving true and false values, you can put it in directly and it will filter down to just the rows where that's true. So we can look at that with heating in our Beijing data set. So let's come up here and do the Beijing PM, and then we'll filter. And if we filter to heating, it will only keep the rows where that's true. So before I run this, first let me rerun, and we can check. You can see with the full data set, we've got four, about 4,300 observations. Once we filter down just to where heating's true, we've got about 1,700. So it's filtered down just to those dates that came before um, before uh, March 15th, I believe. Yes, March 15th. Now with that bang operator, if we wanted to get the flip of that, if we wanted to get just the days where heating wasn't running, we can just put an exclamation point 
in front of that heating column. And again, that exclamation point is going to flip it. So now it'll filter and pull out just the things where that was false. So let's try running that. And you can come down here and see now that we're starting with the ones that are false. So now our very first one, instead of being in January, is on March 15th, when we're assuming that that heating season stopped for the year. So again, I've got this as a slide. This is what exactly what I just showed in our studio. But if you wanted to make some notes, you can do so. So to dive just a little bit deeper in these, I think in some cases it is helpful to understand how R thinks of the logical vectors. We talked a little bit earlier about how for factors, R thinks of them underneath as numbers, even if it gives you a pretty label when it prints it out. The same thing's going on with logical vectors. When you print it out, it's going to look kind of like this, where you've got true and false values. But under the hood, R is thinking of it as a number, and then it remembers what those numbers co correspond to. So for every true, R is thinking of that underneath as a 1, and every false, it's thinking of it underneath as a 0. We can take advantage of this a little bit in doing a few operations. So first of all, just to test that, if you run as.numeric on any of these logical vectors, it will convert it into a numeric class from the logical, and you can see those underlying numbers. So uh, just like for the beyond index, we start it with true and then false and false. If you do as.numeric, you'll see that it's a 1 and a 0 and so on. Because of this way that it's saved, you can do things like sum and mean to get out interesting values. So because every true value is a one un underneath and every false value is zero, if you take the sum across the whole vector, it'll just give you the count of the number of times that it was true. We can look at that with the Beijing example. So we'll do Beijing PM. And in this case, I'll use pull to pull out the vector. And uh, let's pull out the beyond index. And if I run just that, you'll see that that's that long vector where it's pulled out all the values. And it, it's kind of like, you know, it's wrapping around. So it's clearly a vector now. So we can pipe that into the sum function. And this gives us the count of the number of times that it was true. And if you'll remember, this was counting up the number of times that we had a PM value over 500 micrograms per cubic meter. Another thing that we can do at this point is that we can use the mean function. That's going to take the average, right? If you're taking an average of zeros and ones, then what this will give you is the proportion of times that it was a one, because it'll end up being the sum of the number of ones over the sum of the total number of observations that you have. So in, when I run that, we can look down here, and we can see that that was about 0.6% um, of the time uh, there was an observation that was above that 500 level. 